Okay, let's get started today. Um, hopefully this thing's taking video right now. It was not taking video on Tuesday and I had to upload a lecture from a previous semester and I checked it. It seems to be now taking video, so keep our fingers crossed. A um, couple announcements. One, very important, there is no class, well, no schedule, um, no class next week, and the reason is I'm out of town. However, big however, there are video lectures from previous semester, so you're still expected to watch those video lectures, which are on the relational algebra and the relational calculus. There is only one quiz, which is next Thursday. So there's no quiz. There is no quiz Tuesday. That's the only time this semester, actually, where I have no quiz after a lecture. But there is a quiz. For Thursday. And that covers both Tuesday and Thursday's lecture. So the Thursday quiz covers both the relational algebra and the relational calculus. And of course, there's a quiz today. It's due next Tuesday at the normal time. So if you look at the website, you'll see, whoops, not that website, however. The lecture notes you'll see for 9.12, there's slides in lecture, 9.14, there's slides in lecture. So we're covering Chapter 5, Relational Algebra, Relational Calculus next week. Um, I'm still accessible via email, just not, probably more like once a day. I won't be there continuously throughout the day, but you can still post to Piazza. TAs are still here to help. Um, so if you need uh, to go to office hours, they're still around. I um, think that takes care of all of the announcements. So today, we are finishing up SQL manipulation and moving to SQL data definition language. We'll finish up with the data manipulation by talking about subqueries, and then we'll move into data definition language, which allows us to change and control the structure of a table. You've actually, at this point, been introduced to the fundamental operations in SQL, which are select, project, and join. And you can do single relation queries with select and project. You can do multiple table queries with join. Sometimes, People find it easier to use this notion of subqueries to perform operations that could also be performed with joins. There's also a few times with kind of set manipulation where you need subqueries. And then a third situation where you want to deal with an aggregate. So I'll say there's three situations where you want to deal. There we go three situations where you might want to deal with subqueries. So one, not comfortable with joins, or not comfortable, yeah, not comfortable with joins. Okay. Um, I need it for certain set operations involving either exists or in and three uh, need it for queries where 
the where clause needs an aggregate function. So the first one is not strictly necessary. It's just kind of an alternative to joins. The other two, two and three, are more necessary because of restrictions on the language. Two is actually directly related to the relational calculus that you will cover next week because if you remember from 311 that you may have seen that character, the there exists. And that is one of the operators in the relational calculus and you'll see with a query we do today that it's also uh, something that is in at least SQL. Okay. So, we started subqueries last time, and I showed you this example of listing staff who work in the branch at 163 Main Street. And so, you're simply selecting staff information from staff where the branch is equal, and now you have this nested select statement right here. So this nested select is the subquery, and the query optimizer evaluates the queries inside out from most deeply nested to least nested. So the first thing it does is it resolves this query. And it resolves to, in this case, B003. So B003 is the branch number that has the street 163 main street. So then the query optimizer gets that result, substitutes it for the subquery, and performs now the outer query. Okay. And you can actually do the same query with a join. So I could have simply joined the staff and branch tables, said the street needs to be equal to 163 main street, and then extract it based on the branch number, made that equal to the corresponding branch number in the staff relation, and that would also grab all the staff with that branch number. So that's why I say subqueries are often equivalent to joins. And as I said last time on the homework assignments, I generally don't care which you use. I just care that on an exam, if I give you a query, you'd be able to recognize it either way. Also on an exam, I will uh, potentially ask you to write something as a join, and I expect you to be able to do it. Okay, I'm actually, on an exam, not going to ask you to do something as a subquery, um, because I think of it more as a convenience. I prefer joins, and I think generally uh, that's how it's done. So there's three types of subqueries. The scalar subquery you've already seen. A scalar subquery returns a single value. And the example you're seeing on this slide corresponds to the third condition I listed where you want the where clause to have an aggregate. But since you can't actually put an aggregate in a where clause, you can use a subquery instead. Here I'm listing all staff whose salary is greater than the average salary and the amount by which they exceed that average. So I can't say where salary is greater than average salary. Instead, I use this subquery to select average salary from staff, and that returns the average salary. Same thing here, I want to select the average salary from salary, and that will give me the amount by which that staff member's salary exceeds the average salary. And in each case, these two queries are evaluated first. They return the same value, let's say 17,000. So the query optimizer substitutes 70,000 in the, or 17,000 in there and solves the query. Okay. And last time, someone asked, well, could I just put saldiff in here? So ask where salary is greater than saldiff. But you can't do that because 
what you're getting here is some differential salary. Like if this person's salary is 21,000 and this is 17,000, you're getting 4,000. So sal diff would be 4,000. Not only that, you're having multiple staff with salaries greater than the average. It would not be at all clear what value for sal diff to put down here in this clause. So you really need it in both places. Now, that can look kind of messy from this um, query optimizer standpoint. It's not inefficient. It should be able to perform this query once, not twice. But from an aesthetic standpoint, it may not be pretty to have that subquery there. You might prefer to think of it as two separate operations. And for that, SQL gives us scalar variables. And you denote a scalar variable by putting the at sign in front of it. You assign a value to it using colon equal, not equal. It doesn't work if you just use equal. You need colon equal. And you see that you put it in a select statement. So you don't put it out. You don't say average salary equals select. It's actually inside the select. And then you're setting it equal to the average salary from staff. Then after that, you can use that variable in a where clause or to do some arithmetic as I did in the select clause. So that's an alternative way that does not involve using a subquery and breaks the uh, query into two steps and is probably more readable, probably more aesthetically pleasing as well. Again, I don't care if you do it. Either way is fine for the homework. You should be able to recognize both ways for a quiz or an exam. Now, number two here is important. Oftentimes you find yourself wanting to store a table in a scalar variable. You want to create an intermediate relation and you'd like to store that in a variable. You can't do that. The at variable can only store a scalar quantity. If you want to create an intermediate table, you will create a view, which we will discuss later today. So if you want to store an intermediate table, you will use a view, not a scalar variable. Is that clear? Yes. In some cases, you won't know before the select call actually runs whether it's going to return a scalar or a table. Is that true or false? That's false. You will know in advance whether it's going to return a scalar or a table. Okay. I, I suppose, okay, let me put it this way. If it returns a table, you'll get an error message. I guess you could um, theoretically do a select and the attribute you specify could have multiple values. That would be bad. So then you'd get an error message. Okay, so I will say you should know in advance when you do it that it's going to return a scalar result. If it doesn't, the SQL interpreter will give you an error message. Pretty much. It's pretty much only useful there. Um, yeah, that's. I'm trying to think of another situation where I would use it. Can't really quickly come up with one. Okay. So that was one type of subquery. That was a scalar subquery. The second type is a row subquery. It should be in red, but it's not. And that returns multiple columns and possibly multiple rows. So I think it should have been called a table subquery, except that would conflict with the book's terminology for the third type. So the book called this a row subquery. You only use it with an exist predicate. And an example is you want to find all staff who work in a London branch office. So you're going to select the staff from the staff relation, and then you say where exists. And now the subquery is you select star from branch where the staff's branch number is equal to the branch number and the city is equal to London. So basically, this query right here, this inner query, is returning 
all staff, okay, this returns a table with all staff in London branch offices. So in any London branch office. So it's kind of a um, <clears throat> I'm looking at this actually now and thinking that's returning a table with all staff in the London branch offices. Actually, what it is doing, I'm sorry, it is not. So I'm going to erase that because that's not what it's doing. It is actually, notice here, it is using s dot branch number. Okay, there is no staff s in that select statement. What it's doing is it's reaching back to the outer query here. So what's actually happening is that this select statement is rolling through every staff tuple. And for each staff tuple, what it is doing is it's substituting the staff number for that, or I'm sorry, the branch number for that staff member in there. And it's determining whether that branch number matches any branch number such that the branch city is London. So it returns a table with either with one row if the staff member is in a London branch or an empty table otherwise. And all the exists is asking is, is there one true if resulting table is not empty? So it has at least one row in it. I hate this. Okay, I really hate this. I think this is a horrible way to express the query. Okay, because I just think you saw me bobble it. I actually initially gave you the wrong explanation. I actually went over it before class because I knew it always trips me up. So I just really don't like these kind of row queries. Okay, first of all, you could do this with a join very easily. I'm not going to do it but you can do this with a join. Okay, so, and then it turns out that you can also do it with the next type of table query that I'm going to show you, or subquery, and I think in that case it actually is a little more understandable what's going on. So I'm going to move on from here. I think you need to know this type of subquery. I just don't think it comes up a great deal. Okay, so the third type of subquery is a table subquery, and it returns a table suitable for use within, and you're only allowed one column because of that, because in is an operation over a set of items. Remember, in, in a select clause, you can say... where something, and you can say in, like A, B, C, or you can put a select clause, and then it will return, in effect, a set of values. To do that, however, you can only have one column in your result. 
Okay. So here we're listing the properties handled by staff who work in the branch at 163 Main Street. So we select all properties here from property for rent where the staff number, so the property for rent has a staff number, and we're going to select all the staff who work at this particular branch. And you'll notice it is a doubly nested select. The most nested select is actually a scalar right here. This one is a scalar. It will return B003. And then when that's done, this one will return all the staff numbers that are in branch B003. So then what you're saying is select all properties whose staff number is in that set. Okay, so I think that's a fairly natural way of specifying a query. This last query where I'm selecting the staff number, first name, last name, position from staff S, I could also have simply said where in, and then instead of saying select star, I could have said select um, B dot branch number from branch B, and it would have worked. Actually, I would have selected um, S dot staff number from here. But it would have worked just as easily if I'd done an in. So I really prefer um, table subqueries to row subqueries. But I think this row subquery is there because it maps directly to one of the operations in the relational calculus that you'll see next week, and that's the exists um, operator. So I think that's why this particular operation exists. I much prefer table subqueries if you're going to use them. Okay. Of course, this one could be done also. I don't have it, but this one can be done with a join as well, because really all you're doing is a join with the branch relation. So I could have written this. Let's take this and put it on a new slide. So here's that query. I could also write it as select all that stuff. So I'm just going to say select star from property for rent. I don't need it to be this big of a font. So I'll say P comma branch B where B dot branch, let's see. Actually, I also need staff here. Staff S, where B dot street is equal to 163 Main Street and B dot. Why did I get so small? Wow. B dot. Branch number equals S dot branch number and S dot staff number equals P dot staff number. Okay, much more succinct, and I can make it even more succinct than that. I can actually simply say from property natural natural join staff s natural join branch b get rid of all of this stuff 
And now I have a really compact query. So the bottom query expresses everything that the top query expressed in a much more succinct way. Okay, if you're wondering, I just put star there because I didn't want to have to repeat all this stuff, but the star stands for all this stuff. From property for rent P, natural join with staff S, natural join that with, that should be capitalized, the join, branch B, where B dot street equals 163 Main Street. I just find it easier to write the joins. You might find it easier to write the subqueries. So questions about that? Okay. So I wanted this still to be here. Okay, so there are some rules for subqueries. You can't use an order by clause in a subquery. It really doesn't make sense. The query optimizer can do it if it needs to, but you're not seeing the result of a subquery, so there's really no reason to order the results. And generally, the subquery select list must consist of a single column name. That's true for scalar subqueries and table subqueries. The only exception is a row subquery. And you saw this one. By default, the column names in a subquery refer to a table name in the from clause of the subquery, but if it can't find it there, then it refers to a table in the from clause of the outer query. So that was right here. Whoops. Right here we had s dot branch number. Well, the from has the branch relation, but there's no s, so then it went out to the outer query and used that particular variable. And actually, I'm going to start calling these tuple variables because, again, you'll see this in the relational calculus. What S and B really are here are what we call tuple variables, okay, because they're bound to tuples. Right here, this staff S is bound to each tuple in the staff relation and then compared with each branch tuple in the branch relation down here. Okay, and then if a subquery <coughs> is involved in some comparison, meaning it's a scalar, then it has to be on the right-hand side. So this is impermissible because the subquery is on the left-hand side. You have to put the subquery on the right-hand side. And if your question is, what if I need subqueries on both sides? <coughs> it's illegal. So if you do have some kind of Boolean or relational operator involving a subquery, must be on the right-hand side. Of course, I misspelled from. Funny how you can have the same slide for several years and not see the typo. Okay, I am not going to do this exercise, but it's a useful exercise to do, which is to try to list all guests currently staying at the Grosvenor <coughs> Hotel. And you can do it with a subquery. It actually requires two subqueries, but I will let you try to do that one on your own. The answer is on the next slide. You can also do this one with a join. The answer to that is on the slide after that. But as I said, I'll let you do that exercise on your own because I need to move on into the data definition language. Okay. So any questions about subqueries? Okay. So now we switch gears. What we talked about up to for the last week has been how to manipulate values or tuples within tables. Now we're going to talk about how we create tables, delete tables, and add or delete columns. So 
how we deal with the structure of a relation. And this is the province of the database administrator. So what we were talking about before this is something that an end user can do. What we're talking about today, or for the rest of the lecture today, is something that a database administrator would do. So it's at a lower level. It's kind of between what the end user does and the physical implementation of the database. And the main directives we care about are the ability to create and alter a table and the ability to specify integrity constraints and finally the ability to define and maintain views which are if you remember virtual relations that are formed from one or more base relations. I'm going to go quickly through a bunch of these slides because for the most part you should be familiar with them if you have some basic background in programming. So there is a ISO standards body. So you often see ISO. That's the standards um, body that sets the standards for SQL. So all SQL implementations strive to be compatible with the so-called ISO standards. So that's why you see the words ISO. It's an abbreviation. I forgot to look up the name of the organization. Does someone know what the organization is? Okay. Um, at any rate, most of these data types are familiar to you. One set that may not be familiar, a couple sets, are the exact numeric, which are for business applications, and these dates. So the exact numeric gives you the ability to exactly represent a number such as 8.63, which might not be possible to exactly represent using binary digits. So they would actually represent the 8.63 using a different kind of setup, like maybe a packed format where you give four bytes for each um, number because with four bytes you can represent the number zero to nine. And you would put two digits per byte because you can get four bits per number plus four bits gives you eight. So you could pack two digits per byte. So that's exact. And for that, you would use either the numeric or decimal declarations. The two are synonyms. Of course, integer and small ints can be represented precisely. If it's OK to have approximate values, you can use float, real, or double precision. Okay. And it's just like regular um, floats and double precision in programming languages, but they are approximate because you can't represent every number precisely with bits. Then you have the so-called date-time data types. There's date, which is exclusively month, day, year. Time, which is exclusively hours, minutes, and seconds. Time stamp, which combines a date and a time. Then interval is the interval between two timestamps or between two dates, or between two times. So it's just like you can do integer or arithmetic on numbers. Interval is the result of doing arithmetic on two different dates, or two different times, or two different timestamps. It's pretty cool. So you can add an interval to a date. For example, you may want to set a alarm for two days from the current date. You could simply say whatever the date is plus an interval of two days. So an interval is to a date. It's, a, it's the difference between two date-time entities.
Okay, so the only unusual thing about Boolean is that there is a third truth value called unknown, which is represented as null. And it is what you would expect. It simply says we don't know whether it's true or false. It's like Schrodinger's cat. You don't know whether the cat's alive or dead, so it's null. It is Boolean. It is either alive or it is dead. Actually, I guess Schrodinger's cat is both, right? So I guess that's kind of wrong. But uh, null means you don't know whether yet it's true or false. It will be one or the other, but you don't know. Okay, character data can be either fixed or varying. If it's fixed, then the string is padded with blank spaces if it's not long enough. For example, if I say the branch number is four characters and I give it B01, that's three characters, the fourth character will be a blank. If I say varchar, then if I say B01, it will only get three characters. Varchar 30 says it can be up to 30 characters, but if it's only three characters, it will get exactly three characters of storage. Can someone tell me why we don't always use varchar? Because clearly varchar is more efficient for storing data. It's not wasteful like fixed is. So why do we even have a fixed with field? Very good. Slower to index. You can index things much more efficiently when they're fixed length records or do retrievals much more efficiently when everything is a fixed length. That's why it's critical that arrays have a fixed size because the only way you can index into an array is if each entry in the array has a fixed size. So there's a trade-off. A fixed length field is more efficient from a operational or from a time efficiency standpoint. So fixed with strings equals faster whereas there with equals less storage. So it's a trade-off and you just have to figure out which is better. For example, if you're not indexing on it or you can maybe have a pointer or something to it, a foreign key for example, then you may simply make it a varchar. But if it's something like a key, you will probably, or a street address, you'll probably make it a fixed size field. What happens if you've got a fixed size field and end up overflowing? Does it throw back an error? Or does it just That's a good question. Size? I don't know. The question is, what happens if it's a fixed size field and you give it a string too big for it? Um, I'm not sure what happens. It could, I mean, to me, there's two um, choices. One would truncate. One would truncate with a warning. Let's say truncate without a warning, so truncate silently, truncate with a warning and give an error message. I don't know. Um, it's funny. I've been doing SQL for 10 years and never had that come up. So <laughs> I'm a good programmer, man, so it just doesn't come up. That or it's truncating, and <laughs> I never knew it. <laughs> okay. So that's the, just the point I wanted to make about fixed size versus variable. As fixed size is faster, bar char is more efficient. Then numeric and decimal are identical. I think at one point they used one and then decided they were introducing a second term and they, had, they couldn't, for legacy purposes, eliminate the other one. I, for, I think decimal is the one more frequently used. You give it the total number of digits, and then the number of digits after the decimal point. So this is saying seven total digits, two digits after the decimal point. So it can represent numbers up to 99,999.99. And then the only caveat with using integers is if you know that you're using a small integer like the number of bedrooms, use a small int. I think it varies from implementation to implementation what a small int is, but small ints are for small numbers. 
Okay, we already talked about approximate numeric data. Surprisingly, you're able to specify the number of decimal digits that you store with your approximate numeric data. So you could still store a salary as, say, 7 comma 2. It's just that the penny wouldn't be precise. If you're a bank, this is a disaster. There are stories of banks ripped off based on rounding of pennies, people making millions of dollars off of that. So if you're a bank programmer or any kind of financial programmer, you never store a financial quantity as a float lest you want your company to lose money just slowly, but it will bleed it by someone who's clever. Okay, dates. I already told you there's the three types of dates. They have to be in a very precise format. So dates have to be in the format four-year digit dash two digit month. You put a zero in front of the first nine months. And then the date, same thing. You put a zero in front of the first nine days. The zeros have to be there has to be in that format. You put it in month, day, year, and it won't work. Okay, same thing with time. It's HH colon MM colon SS. Okay, the HH does, you can have as many H's there as you want. Okay, but the MM has to be as padded with the zero. Same thing with the seconds if it's a single digit. And then timestamp combines both, and you'll notice that there is a space there. You put these types in quotes. Okay, I didn't put that there, but I'll put it there now. How to store a date. These literals go in quotes, single quotes. That's why you can put a space between the day and the time and the date and the timestamp because they're in quotes. And then here are your handy dandy functions. Now returns the current date and time, so it returns a timestamp. Curve date you should be familiar with or will be coming familiar with. It returns the current date. Then um, date extracts the date part of a date or date time expression. So that's how you extract the um, date part from a timestamp. I'm sure there's a time function that does the same thing for time. And then these handy functions, which you will need at some point in your homework assignment. So date add, add some interval to a date. Date sub subtracts a time interval from a date. Date diff returns the number of days between two dates. So at some point, you're asked to calculate the revenue we derive from a customer. In order to do that, you need to know how many days they stayed at a hotel. Well, you can get that by doing a date diff on the date from and date to. Actually, you reverse it. You do date to, comma, date from, and that will give you the number of days that the person stayed at the hotel. Sometimes you're going to have to add one to a date. You'll have to do that for the date two field because if you are trying to figure out whether a person was there that particular morning, wait, no, 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 no. What is the... Sorry, I want to subtract one. If you want to find out whether a room is occupied on a certain day, okay, so you might have a date like 2017-09-16 is date from, 2017-09-20 might be date two. And I want to know, is a guest in this room on the 20th? If I say cur date, 
between date from and date to, we want to know actually whether it's occupied that night. Should this return, first of all, given that, should it return true or false? Is Wait, let me be clear. Is the guest actually staying here on the night of the 20th? No. Will this return true or false? It will return true, which is the wrong answer. But if I say date sub, date two, and then I say interval, which we'll get to, one day, it will subtract one day from that date, and now I'll have the correct answer, which is false. So that's an example of wanting to be able to do a subtraction. At some point, you will need to do this subtraction in one of your homework assignments. So these date, add, sub, and diffs do a nice job of doing arithmetic on dates. They're very handy. Keep them in mind when you get there in the homework assignment. They're in the DDL slides. Yes? Mm. I forget whether you can add or subtract directly. Pardon? Can you say plus interval three? Okay, if that works, then MySQL is supporting it. Not clear if your code's going to be portable or not, I guess. So if it works, I'm okay with it. I don't mind your doing it that way. Just bear in mind it might not be portable. Yes? Could you use uh, inequalities like greater than, equal to? Yes, than good equal question. Equal. You're allowed to use inequalities with dates, and it, they will work exactly the way you expect them to work. Sure. So that is just fine. Other questions? OK. So here we go with intervals. They allow you to specify a time interval. Generally, you're doing that because you're doing some kind of addition or subtraction. But you can specify it as an actual type. So here, this is an actual type declaration where I'm saying year two to month. And that's going to be an interval that represents anything from zero years, zero months, up to 99 years and 11 months. Here's another declaration of an interval. This one goes from anywhere from two hours, I'm sorry, from 99 hours. 59 minutes, 59 seconds, all the way down to zero seconds. But you can represent seconds to the fourth um, decimal point when you say that. Okay, so that's not here. This is saying two digits of hours with seconds. We know there's a limit of 60 seconds, so we're actually saying it's down to the decimal point. So it's a little different meaning. <coughs> OK, so those are the data types. Questions about the ISO data types. Moving on to the types of integrity constraints. There are five types, four of which you've already seen. So required data means that something can't be null. So when we're talking about integrity constraints in a relational model, we said something might or might not be null. So in SQL, that's called the required data integrity constraint, whether it must have a data value or whether it can contain null. Entity integrity. Every primary key must have a unique non-null value. Referential integrity, every foreign key must refer to a valid existing row in the parent relation or be all nulls. I really should have all the thing or be all nulls here because it can also, in fact, I'll do that right here just to be clear. Or all fields must be null.
And you can have general constraints, such as that no staff member handles more than 100 properties. Okay. The other constraint that they add is domain constraints, which is kind of implicit in the relational module. The model, a set of legal values for a field. So you might restrict the legal values, even if you say it is a string. You may say, for example, that a branch has to start with a B and then be three digits, or um, you might restrict gender to be M or F. Okay. So you might do things like that. And these constraints will be defined in the create table and alter table commands. So if you want something to be required when you declare the variable, you give its domain types, and then you would say not null. And that means it must have a value. With a domain constraint, you use the check clause. And then you would use generally some constraint to specify what is legitimate. So it can be any legitimate SQL query that either checks something or returns a set of values. So here we're saying that it should be in the set M or F. But I believe we have another example later on. Where we say create domain owner number, check value in, and there it's select owner number from private owner. So that's the set of all owner numbers that are in the relation private owner. So that's a different one. Or here, we're saying check value between 1 and 15. So basically, the check statement, the clause in it can either be a predicate, like you see here. Actually, it always has to be a predicate. So here's a predicate. This is also a predicate in but then the value could be obtained from a select statement. So the set of values could be obtained from a select statement. Okay, so, and actually I didn't have to go that far. I could have just done it right there. Value in select branch number from branch. So when you are creating a domain, you can name the domain, and then you can restrict the values in it. So this is a fixed width character field of size 4, but it's further restricted to be the set of branch numbers from the branch relation. So presumably we're setting up this domain for foreign keys. Okay, then entity integrity, that means that we are going to define a primary key in SQL. The keyword's primary key, followed by a list of one or more comma-separated attributes, defines the primary key. And you must declare those attributes to be not null. If you don't, you'll get an error message from the interpreter. You can declare alternative keys. And you do that with the unique. And each alternative key is going to be a um, list. So you could actually have unique telephone number, comma, and then another list. And that would be a second alternative key. And again, when you create these alternative keys, they must also be declared to be not null. Because again, when you declare them as an alternate key, they must be distinct. Allowing them to be null would shred that. Yes, Luke. Um, so where it has two values in the second primary key, there, mm -hmm. um, is that saying both of those? It said the combination of the two is the primary key. So if you think back to the room relation from the hotel schema, there's no single attribute that's the primary key. It was actually hotel number and room number. Okay. 
So that's what that's expressing. Okay, so then referential integrity, we've already said a foreign key is um, a link to a tuple in a, another table. And in SQL, there's a reserved keyword foreign key. Again, that indicates what it references. Okay. I suppose that a foreign key could actually be more than one, but in general, a foreign key is going to be a single attribute, although you may have multiple foreign keys in your relation. For example, in the hotel schema, in the booking uh, relation, you have three foreign keys, hotel number, room number, and guest number. But each of those would get a separate foreign key because each of them references a different relation. Okay, now along with referential integrity, you now have to worry about what happens when the primary key in the parent table is modified. So there's two things that could happen to that tuple in the parent table it could be deleted or the parent key could be updated, changed to a different value. In that case, you have to do something with the foreign key. If the tuple that the foreign key references is deleted, that's going to violate referential integrity now, right? Because that foreign key now references a non-existent tuple. So we have to do something. So when you specify the foreign key, you also need to specify what happens on delete and what happens on update to the parent key. And there's four actions. So cascade means that you cascade the change. So if you delete the parent key, you delete the tuple that contains the foreign key. If you update the parent key, you update the foreign key as well. That's what cascade means. Set null, you set all the fields of the foreign key to null. Set default, you set the fields of the foreign key to the default value. Maybe there is a default branch that a staff member is assigned to, like headquarters, if the branch the staff members associate it closes. So we delete the branch, but we still employ the staff. We temporarily assign them to headquarters. So that would be the <coughs> default value. Or no action, which is the default, if you don't say anything, you just say foreign key references branch number, or branch rather, then the default is the deletion is rejected. The parent will tuple will not be deleted. So typically you want to specify one of these three actions and you do it for both update and delete. So typically you would have both on delete and on update because you might want a different action for delete and for update. Okay, so here on delete we would like the staff number to be set null, and even though I don't have what should be done on update, probably on update we would set it to what? If we change the staff number and the staff one and we update it, what do you think we would normally want to do? Cascade. So probably while on delete we would set null, on update we would probably cascade. So oftentimes it's not the same option for both. Okay. If you want to do a general constraint, you use the check command. And you're allowed to also use the constraint keyword to name the constraint. And check has a predicate. So in this case, we're saying not exists, select staff from property for rent, group by staff number, having count star greater than 100. So I've 
repeatedly used the example of not wanting to have a staff manage more than 100 properties, this is the way you would specify that constraint. So you select the staff numbers, you group from the staff property for rent, group the property records by staff number, make sure none of them have a gra count greater than 100. So this returns obviously a set of staff numbers. You want that set to be empty, not exist. Now, when we get to the homework, you will be asked to create an SQL compliant relation and be asked to use things like create, domain, and check. But you will find that while they're in the SQL standard, you get what you pay for with MySQL, which is it's free, and it doesn't support many of these features. So create domain is not supported in MySQL, and you'll actually get an error message if you try to use create domain. The check and foreign key references are parsed, but they're not enforced. So they're hoping, fake help want it. Please implement this for us, for free, of course. Because we're already parsing it, but we don't enforce it. Okay, they do have something that's not SQL compliant, and hence not portable, which is the enum type. So you can enumerate the set of values that are permissible, and it will be enforced. Okay, so the question will come up on the homework, how do you check whether a constraint actually works? Well, the constraint typically is of this form, like not exists, and you'll just execute the query and make sure it works properly. If it works properly, that's what the TA is testing. Okay. So, we actually went through all of the commands required to create a table, and the actual command for doing it is create table. The command for destroying a table is drop table. It actually deletes all the tuples and removes that relation from the database. Create a view is like create table, except creates a view. Drop view destroys a view. An alter table alters the columns, some property of a column or adds or deletes a column. We're not going to worry about create index or drop index, at least syntax-wise, but they allow us to create indices that make the query optimization process more efficient. We'll talk about that when we get to physical implementation in a few weeks. So the informal definition of create table is you say create table, table name. Then you have the column declarations where you specify each column name, its domain type, any constraint on that column. Then you can list the primary key. Then you can list one or more alternate keys, comma separate it. Then you have your foreign key declarations. And finally, you have your general constraints, which can't necessarily be placed on an attribute. So they're independent of the attribute. So that's the order in which you do the declarations. And create domain goes outside of create table. So that's the whole syntax, which I'm not going to go over if you ever want to, if you're never sure, if at some point you're not sure how to write the syntax, that's the official BNF notation. I won't be covering it. That's why I have the informal slide. Okay, so when you create a table, I'm going to give an example. Here's the property for rent. You'll often see me list relations like this, and I put the attributes in a comma-separated list, and I underline the attribute or attributes that are the primary key. So that's what's happening here. 
is that property number is the primary key. So then I have a bunch of create domains where I'm setting up domains, the owner number, the staff number, the property number. You'll notice that the owner number and the staff number, I'm making them be exactly the set that are in private owner and staff, and I'm limiting the number of rooms to be between 1 and 15. And then dot, 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 there might be some others. Then here's the declaration. First, a list of my columns and their domain types right here. Some of them are not null. Some of them have defaults. Okay. Actually, here I put my constraint about staff not handling too much, so they can go actually anywhere. And in this case, I happen to put it right with the staff number rather than at the bottom, but it could have gone at the bottom. Made the primary key property number. Have one foreign key staff number, which references staff. And you can see on delete, I set it to no. On update, I cascade it. Okay, and there's a couple other foreign keys in the property for rent. One is private owner. Another one is branch number. So I would have multiple foreign key declarations, but there wasn't enough room on the slide for it. Questions about that? It's pretty straightforward. It's just syntax you have to get to. Okay, alter table allows you to add columns, delete columns, add a constraint, drop a constraint. Allows you to set a default or drop a default for a column. Doesn't allow you to change the column domain because instantly all the values in the column would be illegal. If you want to change a column's domain, you need to first drop it and then add it back with a new domain. So here we are dropping the default for position, which would mean that presumably it would be null thereafter if you didn't provide a value, or you'd have to provide one if it was required. Here we're setting the default to F. Okay. Here we're dropping a constraint, and here we are adding a new room with the name is of the attribute is preferred number of rooms. Its domain is P rooms. We could also say things like not null and provide a default value if we want it. So the add statement is just like a normal declaration for an attribute. And then I could say drop and it would, there we go, whoops, there we don't go, alter table client, drop preferred number of rooms would delete the column. Drop table does exactly what you think <coughs> and cascade will determine whether you can actually delete the table. If some foreign key doesn't allow the action to occur, the table won't be deleted. You would first have to remove all the tuples containing foreign keys that reference this table. You won't worry about indices. And I will just quickly go into views. I'm not going to get through them. I will warn you the quiz covers them. And there, I will make sure that in the video lecture there is a part on views. So make sure you listen to that. So we actually have covered most of what you need to know about views. They're a virtual relation produced from some set of base relations. And we can either store the view as a temporary table, or we can recompute it every time we ask to see the view. So a difference between creating it on demand and caching. So view materialization is caching. View resolution means every time we ask to see the view, we create it by doing the actual query.
Then we talk about certain types of views. A horizontal <coughs> view restricts the rows you see. So for example, if we only want to show a manager, the staff at his or her branch, we could create this view. And as you see, we name the view. Then we have an as keyword and the subquery right here, the query, the so-called defining query will create the relation. So this is selecting all staff tuples where the branch number is B003. This is called a horizontal view because we also have vertical views that would show all tuples but restrict the set of attributes you see. It would be like a project, a projected view. So if we don't want staff members to see the salary of their colleagues, we could create a view as, and you notice we did not include the salary attribute. This is actually both a vertical and horizontal view because the where clause is restricting the tuples to those from B003. So this is both a vertical and a horizontal view. Okay, you can also create views, and I'm almost done, that contain columns drawn from aggregated data. So here we create a view of the number of properties managed by each staff. Actually, no. Uh, yes, the number of properties they manage. So we're creating a view. We're naming here, we're naming the columns branch number, staff number, and count. That's what this comma separated list is. And again, here's our defining query s dot branch number, s dot staff number, comma count star. So very simple to set up views. Remember, if you want to create a temporary intermediate result, you create it using a view. With what I just showed you in these three minutes, you actually can create your own views for the homework assignment, which actually is next week's assignment. You don't have anything with views in homework one, which is due tomorrow night, actually Saturday morning. And the rest of the stuff on views is stuff about how you drop them, what happens if the underlying base relation is modified, what happens if the view is modified. I'll make sure there's something on the video lecture that covers that. Okay? So again, remember, no class next week, but you are responsible for the video lectures next week. No quiz on Tuesday, but a quiz on Thursday, and obviously a quiz for today's lecture as well.